Chapter Twenty of the Widow Married: A Sequel to the Widow Barnaby by Francis Milton Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty. Matilda is once more restored to her patty. The stubborn necessities attending nocturnal hospitality painfully displayed. Another adventure which brings back a long absent friend as mrs o'donagough herself was very little better acquainted with the general localities of london than her young daughter there were but two methods by which they could hope to reach the desired bourne of bellevue terrace brompton in safety the one being by the guidance of a hackney coachman the other by that of mr o'donagough the gentlemen preferred the latter as being the least costly of the two only premising before they set out that they should both of them take such heed to their ways as might suffice to direct their return he having business to do which made it quite impossible he could remain during their visit this very reasonable condition was readily agreed to and the conversation en route consisted chiefly of observations relative to it take notice you turn to the right at the bottom of regent street now observe both of you this is piccadilly etc etc at length the street and number indicated in patty's pocket-book were reached and their anxious inquiries for the miss perkinses answered by the agreeable information that they were at home mr o'donagough then departed and his wife and daughter mounted to the drawing-room the act of grisette of the mansion whose lightest labour was that of gentleman woman usher to the miss perkinses may be excused if she found the difficulties of the name insurmountable and announced them as mrs and miss Hodnago the two sisters who had just had time enough to finish the arrangements embellishments and general setting to rights of their little apartment were sitting very snugly and in the most ladylike manner each at her own separate window each with a little round table before her and each employed upon some sort of necessary and important needlework on hearing the door opened they both looked up and on hearing the name of mrs and miss hodnago they both made a grimace and ejaculated who but ere it could be repeated the glorious vision of their bright and grandee friend sailing into the room with all her wonted majesty and followed by her blooming daughter met their view and in the same instant both sisters as if moved by springs governed by one wire clasped their hands started up and exclaimed oh goodness the only difference was that the more ardent feelings of the younger propelled her forward with a vehemence which overturned her little table and brought to view a couple of circulating library volumes which had nestled amidst the stockings and frills with which they were covered miss matilda and patty were as may be imagined speedily locked in each other's arms nor did mrs o'donagough fail to display her habitually caressing propensities but making direct for the slender louisa enfolded her lank form with an energy that for a moment deprived her of breath many and fervent were the exclamations of delight which were uttered as soon as the hugging was over and the four ladies seemed to vie with each other in the strength of the epithets by which they expressed their ecstasy at this reunion for some time the eloquence of each was uttered for the good of all but then patty began to remember the thousand things she had to say which were calculated for the ear of matilda alone and she grew fidgety and restless till she had contrived to draw her confidant to the most distant part of the small apartment but even there she was far from being at ease feeling suspicious that if she spoke loud enough to be heard by her it was nearly impossible that the others should not hear her too could you not take me into your own room for a minute matilda she said abruptly yes to be sure dearest replied her faithful friend it is only the next door and arm in arm they prepared to leave the apartment together when just as they reached the door patty remembered that it would be absolutely necessary that matilda should be made acquainted with the history invented for the entire use and service of herself and her sister and conscious that she remembered not one half of it she suddenly stopped and said i am going with matilda into her room for half a minute mamma but i wish before we go you would tell them both all about our being in london and out of it as one may call it and all the rest of it you know mamma about our beautiful house that we are going to have because when she and i are together we never speak of anything but our own particular talk and yet i should like for her to know all about it too the quick-witted mrs o'donagough comprehended the state of her daughter's mind in a moment and equally pleased by her prudence and the opportunity it gave herself of indulging a little in the imaginative style of narrative in which she delighted she replied briskly to be sure i will i want to tell them both exactly how we are situated sit down dear matilda for one minute and then you shall run off with patty if you will matilda expressed with the warmest gratitude her earnest desire to hear everything she would be pleased to have the kindness to say and seating herself close by patty took loving possession of her arm while mrs o'donagough explained 
her situation as she called it as follows the fact is my dear girls she began we want like many other people of some little consequence in this foolish world to be in two places at once and the consequence is that we can hardly be said to be positively in either a family of high fashion distant relations of the huberts and therefore of mine have taken for the summer a magnificent place near richmond and nothing will content them but that mr o'donagough myself and patty should pass a month or two with them there now most assuredly nothing on earth could be more agreeable than this proposal if it were not that we have such an immense deal of business upon our hands in consequence of our determination to take a house and furnish it from top to bottom mr o'donagough is a man of great taste and perhaps rather too fond of magnificence and i therefore feel it to be absolutely necessary and quite a duty for me to be with him when he is ordering everything for if i am not i feel sure that he will be running into a moderate expense not that i have the least wish to prevent his having everything exceedingly elegant about him a man of his family and fortune of course has a right to it and heaven forbid that i should wish to prevent it only you know my dears that there is nothing like a prudent wife for keeping a man out of mischief when he happens to have a decided taste for expense so i have told mr o'donagough fairly that i will not give my consent to his taking the house or purchasing any of the furniture particularly the mirrors chandeliers and so forth unless i am with him and i have promised delightful as our home at richmond is that i will constantly come to town once or twice a week for this purpose and this promise i am determined to keep however troublesome it may be but poor dear fellow he is so excessively kind and affectionate that he cannot endure the idea of my over fatiguing myself and if you will believe me he has actually taken a little bit of a lodging where patty and i may have a bed whenever we feel too tired with our morning shopping to return with pleasure to our gay party at richmond is not this kind and thoughtful of him oh dear it's quite beautiful exclaimed miss louisa fervently what a husband exclaimed matilda with a sigh i do assure you my dears that the hope of seeing you now and then by this means is one great reason for my approving it and poor dear party is quite in raptures with the plan on that account we can never thank you half enough for all your kindness to us said miss matilda pressing the hand of her friend and at the same time yielding to a hint conveyed by a nudge of the elbow that they might now retire i am so delighted that i have got you to myself once more my dearest dearest patty cried matilda embracing her friend anew as soon as she had succeeded in getting her to the little space before the window which the navigation round the bed rendered no easy task oh how my heart beats to ask you a few questions tell me dearest girl did you see much of foxcroft after we came away oh yes matilda he never missed a day papa and he are thicker friends than ever you'll be sure to see him at our house that is you know when we have got one in town of our own what a delicious idea it positively takes my breath away but tell me dearest for pity's sake tell me did he ever speak of me lots he asked more questions i promise you than we could answer about your family and fortune and whether you had any mother father uncles aunts brothers and the lord knows what it certainly does look rather particular but i say matilda is this great large bed all for you because if it is you might give me half of it you know some day when papa and mamma were gone down to what's the name of the place i wish to goodness it was dearest but unfortunately it is the only bedroom we have we just take what is called in london the drawing-room floor and no more replied her friend so then i suppose that's no go observed the disappointed patty rather gloomily however i have got hundreds of things to say to you and somehow or other we must contrive to be together oh matilda we have got such a man in our house the house i mean where papa has taken the rooms for us to sleep you know such a man matilda as i never saw in all my born days not that he is one quarter as beautiful as my dear jack for in the first place he is as yellow as a guinea and his face is almost entirely covered with coal-black hair but then he has such a beautiful nose and such a pair of eyes if i can't show him to you i shall die alas dearest patty there is but one i care for now talk to me of my poor foxcroft if you love me tell me how he looks looks my dear why he looks much as usual i believe don't be angry matilda 
but i can't for the life of me think how you came to fall in love with such a red nose as he has got and ever so much grey in his hair besides miss matilda perkins coloured violently and for one moment there was danger that the wounded spirit might burst forth and utter words which would have smothered and destroyed the friendship which united them for ever but better calmer wiser thoughts succeeded and ere patty could be quite sure that her dear matilda was in a passion that tender-hearted creature had so far conquered her emotion as to produce a little nervous titter and reply what is one man's meat you know my dear is another man's poison it would be very dreadful patty if we all thought alike about people good gracious what would have become of me if all men saw with young mr compton hubert's eyes for instance in that case poor dear foxcroft's eyes would never have been turned my way and yet you must allow my darling girl that he seemed to admire me most there was upon the very little table which stood in the window of the miss perkinses bedroom a very little looking-glass and upon this patty silently turned a sidelong glance before she answered her friend's appeal and then with all the good humour which a broad grin could convey she replied oh to be sure matilda how could he help it but ere this was uttered the rapid action of thought had restored to matilda the entire possession of her senses she blank found her fair soul and so to find of necessity rendered it impossible to quarrel with her friend ah you beautiful wicked little creature she said playfully laying a forefinger on each of patty's rosy cheeks you know well enough that as for beauty there is not one girl in ten thousand that can be compared to you but the goodness of providence is too great patty to let all men fix their hearts on one let her be ever so beautiful and that is the reason why as they say every jack can find his jill such as you patty to be sure may pick and choose but a poor sort of warm-hearted girl like me ought to and always does receive gratefully the love of a generous and affectionate man even if he does happen to have a large nose and a few grey hairs into the bargain but don't let us talk any more of me tell me darling all that has happened to you since we parted did you go on with the three walks every day upon the pier good gracious no matilda how could i with nobody on earth to walk with that's the plague of it now you see papa talks of london being empty but laura mercy i only wish that i could get acquainted with just one out of every twenty of the well-dressed elegant-looking people i meet i could get up a ball in no time will you believe it matilda i have never danced a step so fond as i am of it since i came to england and i did think that when we got to london i should get a dance now and then but one might just as well be in the woods for anything i see it is a dreadful dull season my dear just now replied her friend but when you get into your fine new house in london patty you will have dancing enough i'll engage for it do you waltz dearest no i never learned but mamma says i shall replied patty i dote upon waltzing resumed the animated matilda i would not confess as much to all the world patty but i have been taking lessons since since i was grown up and i should so delight in teaching you oh i am to have a man master mamma says but i should like well enough to practise the steps with you first how hard it is that we cannot be together observed patty and what walks we could have together responded her friend have you been to hear the band play at the horse guards yet my dear my goodness no i have heard nothing and seen nothing either except my beautiful black and yellow man in the drawing-room said patty mournfully how we could enjoy ourselves to be sure resumed matilda there are a hundred and fifty things that we could do and see together i wonder if louisa she added musingly but there she stopped and patty stood anxiously watching her lips to catch what might pass them next for she guessed in a moment that her friend was revolving the possibility of turning her elder sister out of bed to make room for her dearest matilda tell me what you are thinking of burst from her at last for matilda still pondered silently on the difficulties of the case come back into the drawing-room patty she said at length in a voice that betokened doubt and agitation and let me bring louisa in here to speak to her for one minute and as she spoke she made her way round the bedpost patty following in silence there is somebody wants to speak to you louisa will you step out for a moment said the younger girl to the elder sister and though she meant to speak in a tone of great indifference and composure there was something in her manner which made miss louisa instantly jump up though mrs o'donagough was in the midst of a most interesting description of the splendour of the peters family and exclaim as she left the room 
goodness matilda what is the matter matter my dear how foolish you are there is nothing at all the matter only i wanted to ask you louisa if you thought it possible that you could sleep for a night or two on the little sofa in the drawing-room this dear girl is so longing to come to us and i know the connection to be so immensely important to us both but of course particularly to me louisa because of their great intimacy with poor dear foxcroft do you think you could manage it patty says she is certain that he will be continually with them for he is going to be quartered close to london oh louisa think what i must feel tell me do you think it possible the sofa is so very small said the gentle louisa piteously that i certainly don't think i could lie down upon it in any way whatever but i'm sure i would not stand in your way for the world about captain foxcroft only you know he is not in town yet and i am so very apt to catch cold if i don't lie warm and comfortable you don't understand my object returned the vexed matilda i know he is not in town yet and may not be for months to come but it is cultivating the intimacy with the o'donagoughs that ought to be our great object now and i see as plain as possible that for some reason or other it would be convenient for patty to be left here for a day or two think louisa what it will be when they have a house in town for them to feel that they have been under an obligation to us i would sooner put them under obligation in any other way rather than to have no bed to lie on replied poor louisa with a sort of prophetic shiver very well then that matter's settled and i dare say i shall never set my eyes on foxcroft again cried matilda with strong emotion go back to them louisa and say that i am not quite well i cannot bear to meet the disappointed looks of poor patty oh dear oh dear what a sad business it always is about a bed to be sure i wish with all my heart that my poor legs were not so long and then i should not mind it returned louisa with a melancholy aspect you are a good bit shorter than me matilda she added with sudden animation and as your heart is so much in it perhaps you would not mind sleeping upon the little sofa yourself not the least in the world louisa i am sure i would do that or anything else to please such friends as the o'donagoughs but to tell you the truth i did not think that patty would like to sleep with you so well as with me you know you have never been on the same sort of footing with her and i thought she would like to have all her little gossip out with me before we get up of a morning that's very likely sister but i don't think it is quite fair to lay such store upon it beggars can't always be choosers you know said louisa with a little approach to asperity beggars beggars louisa ejaculated the greatly shocked matilda in a sort of whispered scream for she trembled at the idea of such a phrase being overheard by the aristocratic and high-minded mrs o'donagough how can you use such frightful such ungrateful language well my dear say no more about it ask your young friend to come and we will manage with her as well as we can perhaps you can let me have the mattress out matilda and one of the blankets and then i could sleep very well i dare say on the drawing-room carpet i am sure i would not stand in your way for the world my dear especially if you think it would make any difference about captain foxcroft this was said with the revulsion of feeling which good-natured people often show when thinking they have been rather cross and it was received by the younger sister with a rapture of gratitude that is just like yourself louisa you are a perfect angel in temper and i am sure you might have your choice among captains and majors too if the men did but know their own interest but if i do succeed this time and i feel as if something whispered me that i should if i do become mrs foxcroft you will have a brother who will be ready to repay all your kindness and if i did not know that i am sure i would never think of him the sisters then returned with all speed to the drawing-room where mrs o'donagough and patty had been employed in looking out of the window and in muttering to each other their hopes and their fears concerning the result of the consultation patty having communicated her convictions respecting its subject to her mamma concluding with a remark that if she were asked she should certainly stay whether her papa liked it or not he did not say a word when you mentioned it i marked that said she but i'll make him say yes if he's asked or i'll know the reason why my dearest mrs o'donagough said matilda passing her sister at the door of the room and approaching the majestic lady she addressed with clasped hands and beseeching eyes my dearest mrs o'donagough i have the very greatest favour in the world to beg of you and if you will but grant it i shall be grateful to you for ever and for ever and what may that be miss matilda said mrs o'donagough with a condescending and very gracious smile i hope you will not think me too bold and presuming replied the fair spinster 
but my sister and i should be so delighted if you would let miss o'donagough pass a few days with us will you grant us this great pleasure my dear ma'am we will take the best possible care of her you may depend upon it you are very kind i am sure replied mrs o'donagough with a little laugh that seemed to say that the proposal was very droll and very unexpected what do you say to it patty oh mamma i should like it of all things replied the young lady hanging herself in her usual affectionate manner on the arm of her friend there is nobody in the world that i love so well as matilda perkins and i shall dote upon staying with her well then i suppose we must go home and ask papa rejoined her mother what my dear madam go home to richmond and take dear patty too before we can get your answer oh dear me that will make it so long no no my dear matilda i do not mean that at all replied mrs o'donagough laughing i have got such a trick of calling every place home which i am going back to if it is only for five minutes but i'll tell you my dear how you may be very useful and get an answer about patty and perhaps take possession of her all under one the truth is that mr o'donagough brought us to your door but was obliged to run away directly on account of having lord lord mercy on me i forget the name but he had lord somebody or other to meet it is certain that he gave me the most exact directions possible how to find the way back to the rooms where we put up when we come from richmond but if you'll believe me i don't remember a single word of it so i shall be monstrously glad matilda if you will walk back with us to be sure i will with the very greatest pleasure replied the delighted matilda and then you know if donny is at home we can ask for patty's leave of absence and if it is granted why she may go back with you at once i will take care to send her things after her this plan seemed to give universal satisfaction for miss louisa though invited to join the walking party declined it from feeling that she should thereby lose an excellent opportunity for making all domestic preparations and mrs o'donagough her daughter and her daughter's friend set off for the incongruous purlieus of majestic regent street together in happy conformity to their wishes they found that mr o'donagough had just entered the house no time was lost in making their petition no time was lost in granting it and within a minute afterwards patty was dragging her friend up the narrow stairs in order as she said that she might help her put up the things that were to be sent after her but after mounting about a dozen stairs the young lady paused and whispered in her friend's ear now matilda if my blackbird is in his cage i will show you what i can do by a song cherry ripe cherry ripe 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 cherry carolled patty in very audible notes as she slowly mounted the last stairs leading to the drawing-room and as she expected the door opened and the apparition of the black head and yellow face was again visible at it patty started ceased her song and dropped the parasol she held in her hand permettez-moi said the spaniard darting forward and speaking in the universal jargon by which all nations seem to fancy they can be best understood charmante donzella permettez-moi and picking up the parasol he presented it to her with a fascinating bow at the same time permitting his great eyes to look their fill both at herself and her friend thank you sir you are very polite said patty colouring and having received her parasol with more than one smiling bow she galloped upstairs followed by her friend well matilda said she closing the door as soon as they had entered her room oh patty he is yellow to be sure you don't mean to say that he is as well looking as foxcroft was the unsatisfactory reply to this eager appeal well then you are in love said the disappointed patty but at any rate matilda you can tell me if you think he is a real gentleman why my dear if i was you i would not make any further acquaintance with him unknown to your papa and mamma i have lived in london so long that i am rather used to see those kind of people and i don't believe they are always gentlemen of rank and fortune replied the discreet matilda oh as to that i have made no acquaintance with him at all as yet please to observe for there's no likelihood i should if i am going to stay with you but as to handsomeness he's beautiful enough for a king and that i'll stand to say what you will but come along that's all the finery i shall want and mamma can put out the other things i long for you and i to be walking by ourselves and then we can talk and look about as much as we like won't you rest yourselves before you set out again said mr o'donagough upon their re-entering the parlour to say adieu oh no thank ye papa we are not the least tired are we matilda replied patty 
no not the least added her acquiescent friend and after a few words between the mother and daughter respecting the packet of clothes which was to follow and a proper proportion of kissing and handshaking the young ladies set off on their walk back to brompton are you quite sure you are not tired patty inquired matilda as soon as they got into regent street not a bit replied patty sturdily then let us cross piccadilly and walk down st james street said her friend i never come to this part of the town if i can help it without just taking a peep at that dear st james park i really think it is the most beautiful place upon earth the well-assorted friends had proceeded about half-way down st james street when their four eyes were pleasantly struck by the appearance of two young guardsmen in full regimentals who issued from the coffee-house at the bottom of the street and walked up the pavement towards them a silent pressure of the arm given and returned between the two ladies did all and perhaps more than all that was necessary for directing each other's attention to the interesting spectacle and they walked on together with a step perhaps rather more dignified and measured than usual but with great decorum and without exchanging a word both the young men were tall and handsome and neither of the young ladies refused them the passing tribute of a stare but what was the astonishment of the well-behaved miss matilda perkins when she felt the arm of her young friend suddenly withdrawn and saw her stand with outstretched hands and starting eyes in the middle of the pavement gazing on the features of one of the gentlemen as if turned to stone by some male gorgon the young guardsman however who was in earnest conversation with his companion did not notice her and pursuing their course they presently turned together into a shop the petrified patty then appeared in some degree to recover herself and grasping convulsively the arm of her friend heaved a sort of gasping sigh and distinctly uttered the monosyllable jack End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the widow married a sequel to the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one an encounter embarrassing on the one side and agitating on the other a trial of friendship an impudent manoeuvre and a wise resolution gracious heaven you don't say so cried the sympathizing matilda entering at once into the nature of her friend's feelings this is a most wonderful discovery indeed but you must compose yourself my dear girl you must really lean on me patty and walk gently on when we pass the shop you know you may just look in and if you can catch his face you will be able to satisfy yourself whether you may not have made some mistake mistake shouted patty do you think i don't know him do you think after all i have told you that i should not know my darling jack amongst a million but i am quite sure patty that the gentleman did not know you stuff and nonsense how should he know me when he was chattering as fast as he could speak to that other fellow and never turned his eyes my way but you don't suppose i mean to part so i shall go in after him i promise you and then you shall see whether he knows me or not for heaven's sake patty don't follow two gentlemen in that way said matilda really frightened it is a saddler's shop my dear girl and nothing but men ever do go into it we shall be taken for something very very bad indeed we shall but patty without paying the slightest attention to her remonstrance continued to drag her on and on reaching the shop door without uttering another syllable of warning she fairly pulled her in marching straight forward to the back of the shop where stood the chase in earnest examination of a set of harness patty's object was at that moment not so much to speak to him as to make him see her and this she at length effected by dauntlessly walking round his very elegant-looking companion and finally stationing herself within about half a foot of his person startled at this sudden vicinity of female drapery the young man looked up and his countenance most unequivocally acknowledged acquaintance with the remarkable figure that stood before him hot and agitated her showy bonnet pushed backwards till it was almost off her head her colour crimson and her eyes extended with no mitigated stare poor patty really looked very far from respectable while her terrified companion whose more decent appearance and sober demeanour might have been some protection retreated towards the door utterly incapable of braving a scene which she thought likely to prove so exceedingly disagreeable neither her absence nor presence however were capable of producing any great effect on the catastrophe patty's acquaintance no sooner set his eyes upon her than with a complexion as glowing as her own he suddenly dropped the article he had been examining 
and abruptly seizing her hand led her through the shop and into the street without speaking a word with an agitated and hurried step he urged her forward some paces past the door and then pausing and changing the grasp he held of her hand for the usual salutation of a friendly greeting he said my dear miss o'donagough i sincerely hope i see you well and truly glad should i have been to have shaken hands with you under other circumstances but your referring to our acquaintance on board ship before the friend with whom you saw me or indeed before any friend i have would be very mischievous to me and i remember your former kindness too well not to feel certain that you would be sincerely grieved to do me the injury which would inevitably ensue were you to betray me betray you jack replied patty very innocently good gracious no i would not do you any harm for the whole world but you need not be afraid of speaking to me when we are by ourselves you know tell me when you will come and see me my dear dear jack and she grasped the hand which held hers with unscrupulous affection causing thereby a degree of remorse and embarrassment to the young man of which assuredly she had no idea and which if expressed to her would have been a mystery past finding out distressed beyond measure and moreover very firmly held jack felt himself terribly at a loss to know what he had best do or say next a puzzle which was rather increased than diminished when on casting his eyes towards the door of the shop he had left he beheld his friend stationed there and looking towards him evidently prevented from following him by a species of discretion most terribly injurious to the poor unsuspicious girl whose natural joy at meeting him again had thus undeservedly betrayed her into a situation calculated to excite the most disgraceful suspicions jack was or rather perhaps had been a very harum-scarum sort of youth but by no means framed to endure with composure the idea of producing serious mischief to a young girl innocent of everything save a good-natured and friendly recognition of himself after the struggle and meditation of a moment he said i will come and see you my dear miss patty tell me where you are and i will call upon you patty immediately drew forth her little pocket-book and tearing out a leaf on which she had written her friend matilda's address before they parted at brighton presented it to him i am not with papa and mamma now but visiting a friend said she as she put it into his hands greatly relieved by this intelligence and choosing what appeared to him a lesser evil in order to avoid a greater he once more permitted her to see the smile which had so awakened her young susceptibilities and said that being the case dear patty i shall come and see you with the greatest pleasure but you must promise not to mention having met me either to father or mother i grieve for the necessity which obliges me to impose such uncivil conditions but i cannot help thinking that when i assure you this mystery is essential to my interest you will not refuse to comply with them nothing could be farther from the delighted patty's thoughts than making any difficulty about the matter and perhaps at the bottom of her heart she was rather glad than otherwise that she was to be his only confidant i won't say a single word or syllable to either of them she answered with great eagerness it was always you and me that was the great friends you know jack and so we shall be still shan't we but tell me what your real name is before you go it is not jack now i'll bet it is something that begins with an s mamma says because she saw it on the silver fork the young man coloured and laughed you must call me mr steady now patty good-bye i shall be sure to call on you to-morrow at two o'clock exactly good-bye and again shaking her hand he withdrew making her as he departed a very respectful bow for the benefit of his friend to whom he pledged his word and honour on rejoining him that the young lady he had been talking to was perfectly respectable and in fact hardly more than a child whatever he might think to the contrary patty's first action upon his leaving her was to clap her hands which might be interpreted either as a symptom of violent and irrepressible joy or as a signal to her friend who was by this time at a considerable distance in advance of her miss matilda perkins was indeed in a state of very great agitation and a little forgetful perhaps of the duties which her superior age imposed and which might be thought to include the necessity of not leaving her dear young friend alone under any such circumstances she had pushed onward with all her might and had by this time nearly reached the top of st james street relaxing her speed however a little before she turned into the vortex of piccadilly in which she suddenly remembered that the highly connected miss o'donagough might possibly look for her in vain she had not in truth the courage to turn her head being persuaded that if she did she might be involved as a party in an adventure of which having dwelt in decencies for nearly six-and-thirty years she was very heartily ashamed 
patty perceiving that there was some danger of her being left alone in the street shouted the name of matilda with all the strength of her lungs and then set off at a full gallop equally regardless of the elbows or the eyes she encountered what do you run away for at such a rate matilda cried the panting girl overtaking her and once more seizing upon her arm what a fool you must be to be sure why what in the name of wonder did you think was going to happen to you oh nothing my dear replied miss matilda recovering herself on perceiving that the young lady was alone of course you know i could not think there was anything going to happen to me whatever notice i get from gentlemen my dear patty is in a very different way from being spoken to by strangers in the streets good heaven what would poor dear foxcroft say if he should hear of my being seen following officers into a saddler's shop in st james street i would not have believed it if i hadn't seen it that you could be such an excessive idiot matilda replied patty with some little warmth do you call jack a stranger as for that matter i am sure you are much more a stranger to me than he is dear darling delightful lovely jack how i do adore him and he shall find too that i am as true-hearted and faithful a girl as ever was why didn't you look at him you great goose you never in all your born days beheld anything one half so handsome well my dearest patty now my fright is over i wish you joy at meeting him with all my heart said her companion who recollected how exceedingly important to all her own dearest hopes was the continued affection of her youthful friend you must not be angry with me darling for being a little frightened at first you don't know how particular london people are i do assure you that if anybody had seen us going into that shop after those gentlemen it would have been thought perfectly improper and unladylike and besides my dear girl i do believe that when a woman's heart is so completely devoted as mine it makes them always most scrupulously particular in everything they do about other men i really should have felt that i was acting ungenerously by foxcroft if i had not come away all that may be very fine and very right and proper for you i really don't know anything at all about middle-aged people like you and captain foxcroft but if you fancy i shall ever meet my own darling jack without speaking to him you are quite entirely mistaken i don't care a straw whether it is a saddler's shop or a devil's shop jack is jack to me all the world over of course my dear he is an acquaintance of yours and that makes all the difference and i hope my dearest girl that he told you his name to be sure he did dear fellow his name is steady and he is to come and call upon me at your house exactly at two o'clock to-morrow is he indeed then we must just tell my sister louisa if you please patty that mr steady is a friend of your papa's and don't mention anything about st james street i don't care half a farthing what you tell her matilda you may say that he is one of my mother's fine cousins if you will now that i have found him again i don't care for any earthly thing beside replied patty but by the by she added drawing closer to her companion and speaking with an air of mystery there is a secret about him that he won't tell to anybody but me dear darling i'll keep his secret you see if i don't of course you will patty if he confides it to you and i must say that the glance i had of him showed plainly enough that he was somebody but if he tells you the secret about his disguise on board ship and all that there is no doubt but he will tell it to your mamma and your papa too rejoined miss matilda no but he won't though cried patty exultingly he told me dear fellow that he had very particular reasons indeed for not letting them know anything about it and you don't think i am going to be such a monster as to betray him that's just what he said himself dear creature you won't betray me patty said he and i'll see father mother uncles aunts and cousins too every one of them in the red sea before i'd hurt a hair off his beautiful head i can't help your knowing it matilda because i had told you everything before and that i must make him understand unless indeed you could be clever enough and kind enough to take yourself off and your wise sister too just before two o'clock to-morrow i had rather five hundred times see him alone and then he'll tell me lots more about himself i'll be bound do you think you could get her out and keep away for an hour or two matilda this proposal very considerably embarrassed the fair individual to whom it was addressed to disoblige miss o'donagough or in any way to check the intimacy from which she hoped to derive advantages so very essential to her own happiness was not to be thought of 
yet there was something that rather frightened her in the notion of leaving her friend patty so entirely to her own discretion as she now proposed and without answering very explicitly she only pressed the arm that rested on hers with the caressing fondness so usual between them and muttered something about its ever being she was sure her greatest delight to please her dear patty in all things that won't do matilda cried patty suddenly standing stock still and very nearly overturning a butcher's tray intended to swing innoxiously round her as she passed that sort of answer is not worth a pin i really have a monstrous deal that i want to say to my own dear jack steady and there is more still that i want to have him say to me and i feel most positively sure that he will be quite glum if there is anybody by but me to hear him i'm sure matilda i shall always be ready to do as i'd be done by and i promise faithfully upon my word and honour that if you will but go out to-morrow at two o'clock and take your sister louisa along with you i will contrive to let you have a tete-a-tete in our drawing-room with foxcroft for just as long as you like as soon as ever papa has got his nice new house you know for papa says he is quite sure that foxcroft will contrive to get leave of absence on account of his health or for some excuse or other he is quite sure of it so you see matilda that if you will do what i tell you there is no need that i should be long in your debt the argument thus urged went straight to the heart of miss matilda well my dear she replied i will see what i can do but louisa of course is her own mistress and if she does not choose to take a walk just at that time you know i can't make her but i know that you can replied patty sharply as if i had not seen you come over her hundreds and hundreds of times and when she has set off with saying i don't think i can do that matilda haven't i heard her end at last by well to be sure i dare say you know what is best my dear this being said in patty's best style of mimicry it produced the accustomed meed of admiration from her friend testified as usual by an assurance that she never did no never in her life hear such a mimic but ere this oft-recurring expression was well spoken patty suddenly stood still and having a tight hold of miss matilda's arm caused her to stand still also what is the matter my dear demanded the elder lady matter ejaculated the younger one i certainly shall go distracted that's all i certainly shall matilda if you don't turn back this very instant and scud along with me to my own bedroom as fast as your legs can carry you what for my dear shan't we be very tired patty demanded matilda in a languid voice tired what signifies being tired i should like to know compared to my not having one single bit of any ribbon for my neck or my waist or my wrists but that ugly dark blue that papa bought at brighton they make such a fuss both of em about my not spending too much money in ribbons that i am obliged to be as stingy as a miser over my best and that's the reason i left all my pink pinned up safe in silver paper in my drawer i know it couldn't make any great difference with you and your sister whether my skin looked better or worse but jack i vow and declare i would not let jack come and see me in those nasty hideous narrow blue bows if you'd give me a thousand pounds i do assure you patty replied her friend that you can't look more beautiful in anything than you do in those identical blue ribbons i have said so to louisa scores of times come along my dear was the only reply which the steadfast-minded miss o'donagough made to this friendly assurance and being considerably the stronger of the two her will proved irresistible and the two young ladies once more jostled their way along the ever busy pavement of piccadilly and in process of time again reached the o'donagough lodgings in blank street the ample face of mrs o'donagough was perceptible above the blind of the parlour window considerably before patty's impatient knocking had concluded and she burst forth upon them into the passage with all the eagerness of maternal anxiety just as her daughter raised one foot to mount the stairs what in the world is all this for demanded mrs o'donagough laying her hand on the shoulder of miss matilda for by an active movement forward patty had escaped her what are you come back for something that patty wanted out of her drawers replied the discreet and faithful confidant good gracious what a shame to drag you back all this way why you might have got home over and over by this time said mrs o'donagough oh dear the distance is no consequence replied matilda and you know there is nothing in the world i would not do to please patty 
while this passed the two ladies continued standing at the bottom of the stairs for mrs o'donagough did not feel altogether sure that her husband who was in the act of dining upon beefsteaks and onions in the parlour would be particularly well pleased by a visit from the refined miss matilda perkins especially as that young lady had been informed that they were to dine at richmond at seven o'clock but patty's business above stairs proceeded so slowly that her vexed mother could no longer avoid asking the weary matilda to sit down you won't mind finding donny at luncheon will you she said as she at length threw open the parlour door that silly patty forgot something or other and she has brought matilda perkins all the way back from brompton to fetch it said mrs o'donagough to her husband as she entered but you won't mind her seeing you eat your luncheon you know though it is five o'clock you will be shocked by the sight of so substantial a morning meal my dear miss matilda said the master of the apartment but the fact is lord robert has kept me so late at the club consulting about some private business which has brought him up to town and you may guess how delighted he was to see an old friend at a time when the chances are five hundred to one against his finding a single creature in london he has kept me so devilish late that i was absolutely obliged to send out for something solid before we set off for richmond what on earth can patty be about exclaimed the hungry mrs o'donagough impatiently there never was such a plague of a girl about her things what is it matilda that she is come back for i don't quite exactly know replied matilda blushing and faltering she said she had forgotten something and wished to come back and i did not say much about it do let the girl alone my dear said mr o'donagough if our charming friend here likes to indulge her little whims i don't see why you should grumble about it how you do spoil that girl retorted his lady resuming with a bounce her place at the table and suddenly deciding that she would not be such a fool as to let her beefsteaks get cold for any one i do believe that let her do what she would you would find out some reason or other to prove that she was right she is right now at any rate replied the father looking up as the young lady entered the room for i never saw her look better in my life what did you come home for patty cried mrs o'donagough suspending her well-charged fork within half an inch of her mouth i wanted a pocket-handkerchief mamma replied the young lady as if matilda could not have lent you one i am sure there was something else so you may as well be out with it what's that you have got in your other hand didn't i tell you that i would get the girl of the house to carry your things for you and what is the use then of dragging through the streets with them yourself use or not use mamma i shall carry this parcel because i like to do it and that i suppose is reason enough isn't it what's in the parcel patty persisted her mother pettishly you haven't got hold of my lace collar i hope you take me for a thief do you well that's civil anyhow isn't it matilda said patty with rather an embarrassed laugh but come along or we shall keep miss louisa waiting for her dinner she added endeavouring to back out of the room without further parley come and give me a kiss patty said her father seized with an unlucky fit of affection till now the young lady had contrived to keep her parcel if not quite out of sight at least out of the reach of her mother by holding it pertinaciously behind her back but this unwelcome invitation rendered the manoeuvre of none effect for as she stooped forward to receive the paternal caress her mamma snatched at the parcel obtained it tore it mercilessly open and disclosed sundry owls of bright rose-coloured ribbon a portion of which was daintily tied up in various sized knots while the rest floated left and right far and wide in unrestrained profusion what in the world is all this for exclaimed mrs o'donagough with marked displeasure on her countenance don't you know patty all that has been said about these sort of things what good is it to talk to you like a reasonable grown-up woman while you still act like a child did not your father pay four and nine pence for these very ribbons expressly on condition that they should be kept up as best and worn for nothing but showing off when we wanted you to look as well as possible can you stand there and tell me that you don't remember this i am not going to tell you any such thing mrs o'donagough replied patty in her most rebellious accent and at the same time glancing at her father for support for whose especial amusement she had formed her phrase but it did not answer for he was growing more hungry and angry every moment and turning towards her with unexpected firmness exclaimed don't answer your mother like a fool miss patty what the devil do you want all that finery for want it papa Laura mercy doesn't every girl always want all the finery she can get i am sure if she doesn't she's a fool come along matilda 
was the not unskilful answer of the beauty while replacing her ribbons in their paper envelope but she was disappointed if she fancied that it would satisfy her mamma for mrs o'donagough turning briskly round to the blushing matilda abruptly demanded if they were going to have any company adding but even if you were that is no reason why she should gallop back and ransack the drawers in this way for these pink ribbons were bought to smarten up a morning dress just to call on mrs stephenson you know or anything of that sort notwithstanding her advantages in point of age it was evident that miss matilda perkins could not compete with her young friend either in courage or in presence of mind for she hesitated and looked exceedingly embarrassed as she replied i am not quite sure mrs o'donagough about who we are likely to have call upon us of a morning but dear patty always likes to be a little smart you know before strangers and she'd be the first to scold if i didn't subjoined patty then hastily kissing her father's forehead as he threw back his head in the act of lifting a porter-pot to his mouth and nodding good-bye mamma to her mother she bolted out of the room and the house without running the risk of any further conversation whose usual obsequious civility to mrs o'donagough was altogether conquered by her dread of being entrapped into the betrayal of patty's secret but though the fair friends succeeded in getting out of the house and in making their way safely to bellevue terrace brompton they had not by any means thoroughly bamboozled mrs o'donagough as patty boldly assured her confidant was the case for no sooner had the angry lady refreshed herself by a draught of her favourite beverage than she thus addressed her spouse don't you see donny as plain as that two and two make four that these two girls have got some trick in their heads i'll bet what you please that if you and i make them a call to-morrow morning at a genteel visiting hour we shall find some beau or other there that miss patty is particularly desirous to captivate some of the young lads of the blank perhaps that they used to meet so constantly on the pier at brighton not that i should care a straw for that if it wasn't that they were both so mighty shy about talking of it that looks like mischief don't it it is early days too to catch patty out in such a trick as that replied mr o'donagough however i have no objection to look after her to-morrow morning but mine whatever happens you must leave the whole management of the business to me don't let's have any jawing before strangers for god's sake that's all fair my dear i shan't want to meddle or make i promise you but it will do patty a monstrous deal of good to discover that with all her cleverness there are eyes as sharp as her own though may not be quite so bright End of chapter 21chapter twenty two of the widow married a sequel to the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty two tete a tete and an interruption great want of gallantry on the part of jack enforced confidence succeeded by very familiar companionship a happy little party meanwhile the two friends at last reached their destination at brompton but not before the veal cutlets and mashed potatoes were very nearly reduced to cinders and poor miss louisa as nearly out of temper as her constitutional tranquillity would permit the evening of course passed in alternate mutterings between miss matilda and patty which in style might not inaptly have been compared to those classic eclogues in which a gentle contest is briskly kept up on rival themes for dear beautiful jack steady on the one side and poor dear foxcroft on the other invariably formed the subject of each eloquent speaker's volubility good miss louisa was very little in their way not seeming in the slightest degree conscious of what they were saying and to all appearance as completely devoted to the intricate mysteries of some newly invented knitting as her companions could be in endeavouring to trace the still subtler twistings of the human art the following morning looked so brightly inviting that even the quiet thimble-loving miss louisa proposed a walk adding moreover with more than usual vivacity suppose my dears that we are all to go together to hear the band play it is such a beautiful walk turning in at the green park matilda you know and i don't suppose dear patty ever heard such a band in her life the friends exchanged glances and a little closing up of the eyes and an almost imperceptible shake of the head in each said plainly to the other that it would not do at all it had indeed been agreed between them before they left their sleeping apartment for the uncombative louisa had resigned herself to the drawing-room carpet and a blanket that patty must assign an incipient sore throat as a reason for wishing to stay at home 
while matilda after the one o'clock slice of bread and butter had been handed round should request the company of her elder sister upon some errand of importance to be invented for the nonce the eligibility of performing which should be further made manifest by pointing out the necessity of not letting poor patty talk too much all this was accordingly performed ably and received in the best manner possible by miss louisa and at ten minutes before two miss o'donagough was seated alone and in state upon the miss perkinses sofa with every one of her beautiful pink bows exactly in its right place her black curls a la poodle wantoning over her comely face and her eyes shining with more than usual brightness luckily she did not wait long or it is possible her charming looks might have been injured by impatience exactly at two o'clock the knocker of the house door gave signal of a visitor an active young step was heard upon the stairs and in the next moment the name of mr john steady was announced when patty's own darling jack stood before her the young man though no longer in regimentals looked as she thought ten thousand times handsomer than ever and patty's step to welcome him was so eager that it brought her to the door almost before he had fully entered it oh my dear jack she exclaimed i am so glad you are come and i have made everybody go out on purpose that we might have a long comfortable talk by ourselves what a time it is since you set off in that nasty boat for sheerness ain't you glad to see me again jack most surely i am my dear miss patty replied the young man but you are looking so remarkably well that i have no occasion to inquire after your health have you been in london ever since your arrival oh lor no not we replied patty seating herself on the sofa with a hand extended on each side of her so as to assist in a sort of jump for joy movement with which she relieved the fulness of her heart while she gazed upon her visitor as he sat opposite to her we stayed almost no time in london then but went down on the top of the coach to brighton on purpose to see all mamma's grand relations and there they were lots of em men women and children but there wasn't one of the whole kit that i liked so well as you jack you are exceedingly kind i am sure replied the youth blushing a little and then stopping very evidently at a loss what to say next mercy upon me i don't call that kind because i could not help it you know you could not like anybody as well as me jack could you i am sure nobody in the world can deserve to be liked better because you are always so very good-natured good-natured is that all why i wouldn't give a penny for anybody who hadn't more to say for themselves than that my goodness jack do you remember your jumping overboard into the sea i shall never forget it the longest day i have to live and do you remember who it was that brought you to and then our nice dear ship billiards oh what fun to be sure and think of your trying to make us believe that you wasn't a bit better than a common sailor but i wasn't such a fool as that anyhow my dear miss o'donagough began mr steady but the young lady stopped him short once for all jack i won't be called miss o'donagough or miss patty either by you so mind that if you please or else you and i shall quarrel as sure as you sit there you always used to call me patty and patty i choose to be called and i shall call you jack too unless we happen to have listeners and then i suppose i must call you mr steady the young man seemed to make an effort to look grave but it was in vain and he laughed heartily without exactly understanding perhaps the cause of his mirth his companion shared it and laughed heartily too till suddenly jumping up the young lady seized a pair of scissors that lay on the table and with a hop skip and jump got to the back of mr steady's chair and stationing herself behind it said in a voice of authority eyes front mind the word of command mr jack or i'll cut your head off i will upon my honour what are you going to do my dear girl said the young man disobeying her commands and turning himself round to look in her face do what i bid you said patty and no harm shall come of it see here don't look so frightened a fair exchange is no robbery and so saying the lively young lady mercilessly enclosed within the glittering forceps one of her own ringlets which she scrupled not to blank dissever from her fair head for ever and for ever there now jack look at that said she isn't it a pretty little curl and dropping it rather upon than into his hand she seized the moment in which of necessity his attention was directed to it and performed the same feat upon a portion of the young man's chestnut tresses leaving a very cruel gap just over his left ear now what do you say to that master jack 
i am the same funny girl that ever i was ain't i said patty skipping round in front of him and exhibiting her prize exultingly held on high oh patty this is very foolish what would your mamma say if she could know it said the young man rising and looking very much as if he were disposed to re-exchange the tokens by dint either of stratagem or force come be a good girl and throw it away a fine tall young lady as you are now must not play the same sort of tricks that you used to do when a child throw it away and will you throw mine away jack what a brute you must be to think of it aunt patty very coaxingly approached him holding fast the treasured lock in one hand while with the other she cleverly caused the one he still held to curl round two of his fingers now is it not very pretty jack said she looking up in his face with a sort of deprecating smile yes to be sure it is and you are very pretty too patty said the youth fairly beat out of his discretion and unceremoniously saluting the blooming cheek which had placed itself so near him at the very moment he did so and while the not too greatly incensed patty was laughing heartily at his audacity the door opened and in walked mr and mrs allen o'donagough the parties naturally fell into a tableau and for half a minute not a word was spoken but patty soon recovered both her courage and her tongue and though still blushing a rather deeper tint perhaps than the celestial rosy red of which the poet sings she managed to assume an air of very tolerable nonchalance as she exclaimed so you are come to look after me i suppose but if you look sharp perhaps you will see into the bargain an old friend with a new face mrs o'donagough's first emotion was of a mixed nature being compounded of one feeling a little approaching to alarm and another rather nearer still to satisfaction at discovering her patty so evidently according to her notions the object of a tender passion and that too from a person so pre-eminently elegant in appearance as mr john steady but the words of the young lady caused her to examine the countenance of the gentleman more attentively and ere she had gazed long her whole attitude and manner changed a smile of unmixed satisfaction distended her countenance she laid her hand upon the arm of her husband and drawing him a step or two forward stopped within a yard of her old acquaintance exclaiming in a sort of theatrical whisper intended to be heard with particular distinctness look there o'donagough look there and tell me what you see mr o'donagough's demeanour upon seeing his daughter at a tete-a-tete -tete game of romps with a strange man was by no means so equivocal as that of his lady for he grew extremely red in the face and altogether appeared well inclined to be in a great rage but the accents of his barnaby acted like oil on troubled water his frown relaxed his colour and his collar became mitigated and yielding to her gentle influence he set about staring the stranger very fixedly in the face mercy on me it can't be can it it is not possible to be sure were the sentences he uttered rapidly but with every appearance of satisfaction in place of his late displeasure as soon as the last words were spoken patty who watched him narrowly placed herself in an attitude similar to that of her mother upon his other arm and taking upon herself to answer his wondering inquiries said yes but it is possible papa and what is more it is true it is our own dear jack and no other you may take my word for it and pray miss patty how did you find him out demanded her father turning his eyes abruptly from the face of his old acquaintance to that of his daughter with a look which though no longer so fierce as before seemed to express some curiosity to say the least of it for a satisfactory explanation but the forbidden discovery being made and that without any agency of hers miss patty's difficulties were quite at an end and without affecting any further mystery she replied how did i find him out why in the street to be sure and never was there such a piece of luck wasn't it lucky jack wasn't you delighted to see me it may be remembered that mrs o'donagough herself had never formed any great intimacy with the young shipmate who now stood before her in a guise so wholly different from any in which she had hitherto seen him yet so precisely accordant to the imaginings which her shrewd suspicions had suggested her feelings therefore upon this unexpected rencounter were simply those of triumphant sagacity and it was with a chuckling merriment very little agreeable to the object of it that she continued to gaze upon him from top to toe mr o'donagough was perhaps even better pleased still for not only had the discovery removed some exceedingly disagreeable suspicions from his mind in which his fair daughter was concerned but with the keenness of a professional eye he discerned at a glance 
that whatever might have been the cause of the masquerading carried on amongst the crew and passengers of the atalanta the young man was decidedly of that class of society among which he particularly desired to increase his acquaintance and this unexpected accident seemed to offer a very excellent opportunity for doing so thus the only person in the group who felt not perfectly and pleasantly at ease was poor jack himself and he would gladly have given a joint of his little finger to escape answering patty's affectionate query and too perhaps might the sacrifice have placed him clear of the adventure altogether wasn't it lucky jack reiterated patty and ain't we famously caught out with our locks of hair exchanged and the young lady held up to view the shining trophy she had won while her eyes directed those of her observant papa and mamma to the now considerably deranged curl which the unfortunate youth still held between his fingers luckily for him the necessity of immediately replying to patty's tough query was obviated by mr o'donagough's saying as if in consequence of the intelligence conveyed by the tell-tale locks of hair you will not be surprised sir if i now think it right to request you will inform me what your real name may be jack is perfectly dumbfounded poor dear fellow exclaimed patty laughing but i can tell you his name papa without plaguing him to speak if he had rather let it alone his name is steady mr john steady and that answers to the fork don't it mamma mr o'donagough said the young man appearing suddenly to rouse himself with the energy of a newly formed resolution will you give me leave to speak with you alone for five minutes gracious goodness can it be about marrying her thought mrs o'donagough he is going to pop the question as sure as my name's patty inwardly murmured her daughter unconsciously clapping her hands in the ecstasy of her heart mr o'donagough himself however felt convinced in a moment from the tone of voice in which the request was made that the object of it was not his daughter yet nevertheless he had enough of interest and curiosity in the business to answer readily i shall be very happy to hear sir whatever you may be pleased to communicate to me which assurance was given in mr o'donagough's most respectful and gentlemanlike manner may i attend you to another room sir said the young man is there any room here patty into which i can show this gentleman inquired her father no that there isn't papa except the perkins's bedroom and that's all in a litter i'll be bound then we will take a turn in the park mr o'donagough if not disagreeable to you said the young man taking up his hat and deliberately laying down poor patty's ringlet in its place mr o'donagough replied only by a bow and they left the room together as the subject matter of the conversation between patty and her mother may be easily guessed it is unnecessary to repeat it and we will therefore follow the two gentlemen into hyde park where as by mutual consent they chose a path the least liable to interruption when the following conversation took place it can hardly be necessary for me to inform you mr o'donagough began the young man that folly and frolic must be pleaded in excuse for my having made your acquaintance under false colours i am very glad to hear my dear sir that there was no worse cause for it said the elder gentleman sir in very haughty accents was the rejoinder of the younger one i feared it impossible resumed mr o'donagough in his best manner that some unfortunate affair of honour might have rendered a distant expedition necessary or at least prudent no sir thank heaven i have nothing so irreparable on my conscience the history is briefly this i was left without father mother or any near relative except a sister still younger than myself with a large fortune and a personal guardian for whom i had conceived a very unjust but very strong dislike for a few years i pursued my studies at eton with tolerable propriety i believe but at the end of that time my guardian wished me to go to college while i insisted upon immediately entering the guards which produced a quarrel all the faultiness and all the violence of which belonged wholly to myself i am sorry to confess that it was the mere wantonness of intentionally giving this excellent friend as much pain and anxiety as i could well devise that i set off for australia without communicating to him the slightest intimation of my intending to leave england at all and aware that if i went under my own name he would be likely to get the intelligence from the newspapers i had the folly to go out in one ship in the character of a mechanic about to seek my fortune in a new world and return in another under the semblance as you know of a common sailor belonging to the crew in the latter case however i confided a portion of the truth to the captain and crew partly because i felt it would be impossible to keep up my assumed character with them on account of my nautical ignorance and partly i own for the sake of arranging the minor particulars of my passage on a more agreeable footing than i had thought it necessary to do in going out 
my name however it was not necessary to disclose and i believe i left the ship at sheerness without anything more being known of me than i was a lad with a good deal of money and a roving sort of disposition which had led me to take a trip that i did not wish to have known and this in fact was the exact truth i had one confidant and one only to this thoughtless frolic my sister knew where i was gone and from her i received one letter directed to me according to my instructions under a feigned name to the care of a merchant at sydney this letter produced a total revolution in all my feelings respecting my guardian it described his sufferings on my account as so much more blended with affection than i had ever believed possible that my heart was softened and my spirit sobered at once but it had never occurred to him that i could have committed any greater folly than the merely keeping myself concealed near london and as my sister faithful to the promise i had extorted from her never betrayed her knowledge of my having quitted england his regret and his sufferings were wholly occasioned by the idea that he had wounded a too sensitive temper by the assumption of more severe authority than he ought to have shown come back instantly wrote my sister and never let him know the whole extent of your folly it was from a wish to follow strictly this advice that i so cautiously concealed my name and station and as he has never since my return asked me a single question respecting my absence i have never yet recurred to the subject we are i am happy to say on the best possible terms and though i have been for some months of age i would have been perfectly willing to atone for past rebellion by entering myself at oxford but of this he would not hear and convinced as he kindly says that my former opposition proceeded from a genuine and decided preference for the profession i was so eager to enter he himself arranged everything respecting my commission and i am now with much better luck than i deserve in precisely the position i desired without the mortification of having my boyish escapade brooded from one end of the country to the other you will perceive therefore mr o'donagough that i have very strong reasons for not wishing to have our meeting on board the atalanta made known and i shall hold myself greatly indebted to your courtesy if you will never under any circumstances allude to it and shall be grateful also if you will use your influence with the ladies of your family to the same effect depend upon it my young friend replied mr o'donagough in an accent of much kindness depend upon it your secret is perfectly safe with me nor do i fear the discretion of either my wife or daughter patty is as good a girl as ever lived and with all her high spirits is as gentle and obedient as a lamb to every wish that either her mother or i seriously express to her and for you dear jack but this familiar appellation must be used no longer may i ask sir if your name be really steady no sir it is not replied the young man colouring mr o'donagough said no more and the silence which ensued was rather awkward it was the young incognito who broke it by saying with a good-humoured smile i tax your kindness severely perhaps mr o'donagough both by my confidence and by my want of it i am i believe absurdly anxious about this concealment but the fact is some of the friends whose good opinion i most highly value fancy that the interval of my absence has left some traces of improvement with me and my sister assures me that the general belief is that i have passed my time in profitable reading whereas in truth i have done nothing save finding a little leisure to reflect and though i would not were i questioned falsify a single passage in my history i would rather at least for the present that things remained as they are therefore mr o'donagough if you will have the kindness not to urge the disclosure of my name i shall really feel it as a great obligation is it your wish then that we should still call you mr steady demanded mr o'donagough gravely this was a trying question for had the young man answered it sincerely he could only have said that he trusted no circumstances were likely to occur in which there would be any necessity for his being addressed by him or his family at all but to utter this was of course impossible and after a moment's hesitation he replied yes sir another silence followed which like the former one was at length broken by jack i believe mr o'donagough that we may now turn back again said he and i beg you to accept my thanks for your obliging attention to my foolish story mr o'donagough followed the movement made by his companion and turned about to retrace his steps to brompton but he was not fully satisfied with the manner in which the conference appeared likely to conclude and ere he had taken many steps he said will you before we part permit me to make one observation my dear sir the young man bowed his willingness to hear it 
it is never wise resumed mr o'donagough believe me sir it is never wise to repose a half-confidence in any man i will not charge myself with any greater infirmity of curiosity than i believe affects all the rest of us but neither will i attempt to deny that i do feel and shall feel a desire perfectly idle as i am ready to confess to learn your real name you must be aware that the generality of men might feel this without confessing it but i have still a very fresh remembrance of the amiable manner in which your gay spirits beguiled the tedium of our long voyage and i cannot resist the friendly feeling which prompts me to advise your trusting me with a name which i will tell you frankly cannot be long hidden from me you will perhaps as the season advances be likely to meet me more frequently in london society than you may expect though i have no secrets to keep me silent i am not much given to talk of my own family and connections or you would probably know by this time that i am highly connected as well as my wife who you may perhaps have heard mention her family no sir never replied the young man dryly and with a feeling not perhaps very carefully concealed that he did not feel any great interest on the subject i think you told me you were in the army said mr o'donagough i did sir replied the ci-devant jack with some haughtiness but i did not imagine the information could give you any right to cross-question me believe me i have no such intention i was about to convey information not to seek it and you will judge me fairly you must i think perceive that my only possible motive for pursuing this conversation is to prevent your fancying yourself more secure from all chance of my discovering what you wish to conceal than you really are i alluded to your profession sir because i conceive that it renders it almost certain you must know the name of general hubert know the name of general hubert repeated the young man suddenly standing still and looking earnestly in the face of his companion most assuredly i know his name may i inquire your reason for asking the question the general's lady is my wife's niece quietly replied mr o'donagough the effect of this announcement which was made at random without the slightest idea that the general's name was better known to his companion than that of any other officer of equal rank was sufficiently strong to convince the speaker that his young listener was at least in some degree in his power the youth changed colour began to speak then suddenly checked himself and at length ejaculated more as if thinking aloud than with the purpose of making any communication this is indeed a most unexpected coincidence are you acquainted with the general said mr o'donagough without appearing to notice his agitation very well very much i am very much acquainted with him stammered the young man in reply and then added rapidly and as if from the impulse of a sudden determination it must indeed be in vain for me to attempt any further concealment from you mr o'donagough may i hope that in giving you my full confidence i am giving it to a friend who will kindly seek to assist rather than to thwart me with an air of candour and sincere good-will that was really touching mr o'donagough stood still for a moment and extending both his hands received that of his companion between them be very sure of it my dear young friend said he cordially shaking and pressing the hand he held be very sure of it i can have no motive on earth for betraying a confidence that does me both honour and pleasure tell me your real name dear jack and it shall be henceforth numbered among those of the friends whom i most desire to serve i am sir henry seymour said the young man and so saying he withdrew his hand as if by a movement that was involuntary yet at the same moment declared himself much obliged and quite confident that mr o'donagough would faithfully keep the promise he had given him now then let us return to the ladies my dear sir henry said the well-pleased mr allen o'donagough you are very good but i must beg you to excuse me replied his companion i have in fact business which obliges me to visit the horse guards immediately pray make my compliments to the ladies good morning but for god's sake don't go my dear sir henry till you tell me where i can find you again besides i have fifty things to say to you i will walk a little way towards the horse guards with you i want you to tell me beyond all things how such a gay young fellow as you are ever came to be so very much acquainted with my stiff nephew-in-law general hubert sir edward stephenson was my guardian replied sir henry seymour with ill-concealed reluctance ay ay that explains it lady stephenson is hubert's sister i don't know sir edward as yet but what a capital good fellow his brother frederick is we have just parted from him at brighton did you ever visit him there sir henry the fine fellow has found out the only good house in the place and famous feeds he gives there i promise you 
what a pretty little toy his wife is isn't she so like a wax doll but she is a nice little creature too so friendly where she takes a fancy patty was a prodigious favourite and though she is too young to go out much without her mother i did not quite like to refuse because it was such a near connection and i saw so plainly that she meant to be kind and hoped to be an advantage to our young exotic but to tell you the truth my dear fellow she was a little too good-natured to our dear agnes's second son compton who entre nous be it spoken was much sweeter upon his cousin patty than i quite approved i don't like love-making between such very near relations and though it was as clear as light that my girl had no particular fancy for him in fact she always seemed to be thinking of something else god knows what though it was most perfectly clear that patty did not very much like it the good-natured nora would constantly ask him every evening that we were there and that in fact was constantly however he is young enough to forget it and we must trust to that all this wild sounding rattle so unlike the grave and meditative tone which o'donagough had been practising with general hubert was not assumed without a purpose or rather it was not assumed without many purposes it was necessary in the first place to establish beyond the possibility of doubt the important truth that he was what he declared himself to be namely the near connection and intimate associate of general hubert himself and everybody belonging to him it was important too that sir henry seymour should be made to understand that the blooming patty was already an object of tender attention to others and beyond all else it was important that his own manners with the young baronet should from the first assume that air of easy gossiping frankness which was as he had often found the most certain prelude to profitable intimacy the first item in this list of reasons might have sufficed had mr o'donagough been fully aware of all the weight it carried with it at the first statement of near connection between the families of hubert and o'donagough the young man's heart swelled with indignant incredulity but the mass of evidence contained in the familiar mention of the whole race by a person of mr o'donagough's age and appearance together with an assumption of relationship which however improbable was not likely to have been invented succeeded in convincing him that such was the fact and the moment this was achieved all that followed was wholly superfluous nothing like a cold return for offered civility was to be feared from sir henry seymour towards any one who could boast the advantage of such a relationship his attachment to the whole hubert family was in fact unbounded he considered himself under the deepest obligation to them for their constant kindness to his young sister and was not likely to forget the lenient gentleness with which his own errors had been treated yet though all this was likely very greatly to influence his conduct it could not alter his feelings and he groaned in spirit when having at last got rid of his ship acquaintance he meditated on all the irksome annoyances to which this most unfortunate rencounter was likely to lead that its effect on the other parties was quite as much opposed to this as the positions assigned to the north and south poles need hardly be mentioned the calculating mr o'donagough seemed to tread on air as he paced back to brompton after accompanying his new favourite to the archway of the horse guards visions of little profitable evenings passed at home of his name set down and favourably balloted for at fashionable clubs of his own hospitalities returned by dinners with the gay young guardsmen and finally of a match for his blooming patty which would not only gratify all his ambitious wishes for her but ensure to himself as firmly at least as anything could the power of holding on to the class among whom it was the darling desire of his heart to move all seemed to flash before him in such bright but palpable distinctness that he felt the glorious game to be entirely in his own hands he had in one word got possession of the young man's secret and it depended on himself to make a good use of it he found the two miss perkinses returned when he reached their dwelling and the gabble of female tongues which greeted his ears as he mounted to the drawing-room was delightful to him for it sounded like a flourish of trumpets announcing the return of a victor if they were thus joyous with what they knew already what would their feelings be when they should learn all of which he had so skilfully achieved the knowledge no shadow of mystery or reserve was now left to injure the happy union between the perkinses and o'donagoughs and it was therefore with unmitigated freedom that the anxious mother exclaimed as he entered now then out with it donny what is his real name after all mr o'donagough looked upon the little circle with a benignant smile don't stand grinning there papa cried patty rushing towards him and seizing upon the collar of his coat with the consciousness that he and his news at that moment particularly belonged to herself 
tell us all you know this very moment or you shall find that you had better not tease me tease you my beauty no faith i must not tease you any more for i must say for a young lady of fifteen you have got up as nice a little love affair as the most prudent parent could desire the gentleman is sir henry seymour ladies and as i have every reason to believe a man of large fortune and high connections good gracious only think said miss perkins the elder my adored patty how i wish you joy said miss perkins the younger nobody in their senses could ever doubt that my girl was likely to do well was pronounced by mrs o'donagough with infinite dignity and very stately composure while patty who whatever she might come to hereafter had not yet attained such perfect self-command started back and joyously clapping her hands as she bounded in a prodigious jump from the floor exclaimed shall i be my lady then when i am jack's wife shall i papa upon your life and honour end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of the widow married a sequel to the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty three practical information carefully obtained and promptly acted upon a great change takes place to all outward appearance in the fortunes of the o'donagough family mr o'donagough feels this and confesses it happy prognostications the adventure made a considerable change in the proceedings of mr o'donagough a very few inquiries sufficed to assure him that sir henry seymour was a young man of large and unencumbered estate with the accumulated product of fifteen years minority just placed at his own disposal that he was moreover of a gay and pleasure-loving temperament and conceived to be exceedingly liberal in his expenditure and generous in disposition it was not likely that a man of mr o'donagough's discernment could be insensible to the value of such a character or in the least degree indifferent to the probable advantages it might bring to all who were fortunate enough to fall into intimate connection with it neither was there any danger that he should undervalue the degree of influence which his knowledge of the young man's private affairs was likely to give him with all this working strongly together in his brain he soon came to the conclusion that no half measures could suit the present position of his affairs and without confessing even to the wife of his bosom that he had greatly changed his immediate plans he set about looking for a house in good earnest and determined that this should be such a one as should aid all the bold projects he had in view had he deemed it wisest best mr o'donagough was not without the means of furnishing a splendid mansion in very showy style and yet not leaving a single morsel of lacquer or ormolu unpaid for but he was far too clever a man to risk on any speculation a single sixpence more than was needful to give it a fair chance of success and he therefore decided upon selecting a ready furnished house as the scene of his first attempt on a large scale in london should it fail should vexatious accidents of any kind arise to cut short his career the loss might be easily calculated and a retreat easily effected his resolution once taken he lost no time in putting it into execution an extremely gay-looking residence in curzon street in the rent of which the proprietor was disposed to make some sacrifice for the sake of letting it for a year and at an unfavourable season fixed him at once he agreed without difficulty to pay the rent in advance and exactly one week from the day on which he had been led into the confidence of sir henry seymour he informed his wife and daughter that he had secured for their use for the year next ensuing an elegant mansion in one of the most fashionable streets in london the effect of this news upon mrs o'donagough was very like that of intoxication only that the symptoms continued to show themselves for weeks instead of hours at first she began to talk with exceeding rapidity seemingly indifferent whether any one listened to her or not then she laughed much and often having no obvious cause for it whatever and then she would sit in strange abstractedness with a look that might have been mistaken for a sign of headache or approaching somnolency but which in truth betokened the very reverse being rather an evidence of faculties particularly awake and intent on very high and mighty objects patty was altogether in a state of mind and spirits which rendered the fine house of small comparative importance though had she at any moment been told that there's no such thing it is probable to use her own phraseology that she would have cried her eyes out 
but so predominant were the ideas that she was certainly going to have jack for a husband and to be called my lady that no subjects of lesser interest could long retain possession of her memory the friendship of the two miss perkinses was at this time invaluable and so thoroughly aware did mrs o'donagough become of the absolute necessity of having some one on whom she could discharge her thoughts that she induced her husband to abandon entirely his visionary friends at richmond and confess that he found it was quite necessary they should remain in their little bit of a lodging till their own house was ready for them this obviated all difficulties and the excellent miss perkinses trotted daily from brompton to the bit of a lodging and from the bit of a lodging to curzon street with a resolute perseverance that nothing but the most devoted friendship could have inspired beautiful rooms ain't they louisa isn't the third drawing-room a perfect paradise matilda what a place for flirting girls that sofa in the recess is the prettiest thing i ever saw in my life said mrs o'donagough for the twenty-seventh time as her two friends and her daughter roamed about the house from garret to cellar on the third day after it was taken how i do wish they would get these tiresome beds put up isn't it too hard to have such a house as this and not be able to get into it donny donny where in the world has your father got to patty he never is in the right place by the by dears i must leave off calling him donny mustn't i it will never do in such a drawing-room as this to be sure it is quite unaccountable how one does get into foolish vulgar ways sometimes and it's a proof isn't it that one always ought to keep oneself up even if one sees nobody nor nothing however there is no great danger of my not getting out of it again my first recollections are of the most refined kind this is a charming house to be sure but no more to be compared to silverton park than chalk to cheese i shall like to see our friends the officers here matilda won't it be nice these words instantly brought the lady she addressed to her side for though till that moment she had been entirely engrossed by her friend the future lady seymour there was in them a charm powerful as magic to which the endearing i say matilda of her young friend was in comparison but idle breath dearest mrs o'donagough returned the fluttered and flattered young lady gliding across the room to her with a movement not unlike that of a figure cut in paper and blown across a table by the artificer dearest mrs o'donagough how i long to see you installed with all your proper style and state about you and receiving company in your own elegant and graceful way to be sure there never was any one so perfectly made by nature as one may say to give parties as you are your manners your kindness your person your very style of dress all seem formed on purpose for it i am sure it is a blessing and an honour and a happiness to know you well well tilda we shall see we shall see by the by i'll tell you what i should like as well as anything in the whole job and that is making my old ram's horn aunt betsy come to see me here won't i make her remember the bees and the bread and milk notwithstanding all the eager attention with which miss matilda looked up into her face most sincerely wishing to understand every word she uttered there was a mystery in this allusion which defied her sagacity stretched as it was to the very utmost and she could only reply by laying her hand with a fond squeeze on the plump arm of her magnificent friend and repeating with a little coaxing laugh dearest mrs o'donagough but that's neither here nor there resumed the great lady recollecting herself i was thinking of bygone times when that crabbed old soul was a perfect tyrant to me i don't mean of course that she was not always living in very high style as a person of her noble birth and immense possessions ought to do but you know my dear many old people both rich and poor like nothing so well as tormenting young ones and what i said about the bees and bread and milk came from recollecting the time when she kept bees for her own amusement in some most elegant golden hives and then instead of letting me look at them ordered the footman to take me to the housekeeper or the lady's maid i'm sure i forget which to eat bread and milk for supper so spiteful of her wasn't it matilda spiteful indeed dearest mrs o'donagough i cannot conceive how any human being could ever have the heart to be otherwise than kind and affectionate and in fact altogether doting upon you replied miss matilda i don't suppose there was a person she continued so made in every way to be liked and loved as you are 
i am sure louisa and i sit by the hour together and have done ever since we first knew you talking of nothing in the world but your particular manner of being delightful to everybody poor dear louisa you know is very shy but she declares that in your company she forgets it entirely and feels as easy and as happy almost as if she was quite by herself i am very glad to make louisa happy and you too my dear replied mrs o'donagough swelling a little as she was wont to do when called upon to assert her dignity but to tell you the real truth my dear miss matilda perkins i shall feel that i owe it to myself when i get into this house and to my family also to keep up with most people that sort of dignity and reserve which my station requires i can assure you that silverton park when i was quite a newly married and very young woman though it was celebrated through all the west of england as a scene of the most delightful hospitality never witnessed the slightest attempt at undue familiarity from any of its innumerable guests towards me as this was uttered with appropriate accent and attitude the soul of the gentle matilda seemed to die within her as she listened to it but mrs o'donagough on perceiving the effect she had produced felt satisfied that she might again relax a little with safety and immediately added but you and your sister are particular friends you know and i shall never insist upon any alteration in your manners when we are quite by ourselves when there are strangers present of course you will understand that there should be a difference what do you say prosing there for matilda cried patty at this moment turning from an unprofitable examination of the empty street come here can't you you know i have got lots of things to say and you may just as well leave mamma alone louisa will do for her to count over the chairs and tables with what a madcap exclaimed mrs o'donagough with a graceful air of elegant indulgence go to her my dear and send your sister louisa to me she is quite lost poor thing in the delight of walking about these pretty rooms for after all i can't say i consider them as anything more than merely pretty however they will do very well till that wild girl of mine is sobered down into a woman of fashion and a wife and then i flatter myself that mr allen o'donagough will think it right and proper to take me into a square to live this house is all very well for a street but i very much doubt if sir henry get along matilda added the tender mother pointing to the frowning beauty who stood impatiently waiting for her listener while this harangue went on go on to her dear and tell her she must never let sir henry see such a face as that miss matilda who had stood between the mother and daughter during mrs o'donagough's last speech like a bit of rubbish on the wave of a retreating tide seemingly returning from time to time but really becoming more distant at every movement joyfully accepted this dismission and ere another moment had passed was enjoying herself in the balcony of the front room with patty once more hanging upon her arm how can you be such a fool matilda as to stand listening for an hour together to mamma's humdrums said the young lady judiciously placing herself and her friend as much out of sight of those within the windows as the premises would allow a child of five years old could manage better than you do upon my word patty you are out there replied her friend it is from no want of wit or will either on my part if i leave you for a moment for goodness knows i had rather be talking with you than anything else in the world excepting you know when you happen to be engaged in another way or she added after a pause and with a deep sigh or if poor foxcroft was even again to steal into my heart with his delicious converse oh for that matter i never want to spoil sport any more than you do matilda we are both of us good-natured girls in that way do as you would be done by that is our motto isn't it but i have no notion of your leaving me with my finger in my eye because i have got no one to speak to while you stand palavering with mamma said miss o'donagough but i must patty if it is her will and pleasure you know i can tell you if you don't know it already that your mamma expects a great deal more attention and ceremony and all that sort of thing now a great deal more indeed than she did at brighton in short she says to herself openly and plainly and i see as plain as daylight that if i am not very attentive and respectful all the fat will be in the fire and what will become then of all the happiness we expect together returned her friend once for all matilda i'll tell you plainly that you had better mind your hits between mamma and me i won't bear to be neglected for any one and if you don't choose to be my particular friend and stand by me through thick and thin without caring a pin for anybody else somebody else shall that's all i have no notion of mamma setting herself up for no other reason in the world than just because my jack happens to be a sir 
and who has the best right to set themselves up because of that i wonder so you will just please to take your choice miss matilda oh my darling only patty returned the terrified favourite in an accent which seemed to predict a shower of tears how can you speak so cruelly do you not know how i dote upon you don't you know that excepting my poor dear foxcroft to whom i am determined to be as faithful as you have been to your jack don't you know that excepting him there is no living creature in the whole wide world that i love and dote upon as i do you very well then don't let us say any more about it but tell me matilda what do you think i ought to say the first time my beautiful sweetheart asks me downright to marry him say my dearest creature why just at the very first i suppose you must say that you are too young to think of such a thing but suppose he should take me at my word matilda suppose he should really go away again for heaven knows how long just as he did when he went to sheerness you know what would become of me then oh you must take care of that dearest you must take care that he does not out and out suppose you are quite in earnest common sense teaches one you know when one says anything of that kind to do it with a sort of look or hesitation or something or other that shall make a man understand if he is not a very great fool indeed that you don't mean to kill him with cruelty well then that will be got over without danger for my sir henry jack is no fool i promise you replied patty exultingly but i say matilda how long do you think it will be before we shall be all right and ready to invite him quite directly i should think as soon as you have got into the house i mean replied her patient friend who had listened to the same question and made the same answer about a hundred and fifty times since the curzon street house had been taken meanwhile mr o'donagough who in his own way and in a less demonstrative manner was quite as desirous of getting things entre as either patty or her mother did an immense deal of business in a wonderfully short space of time and performed it all with as much skill as despatch it would not be easy to paint mrs o'donagough's ecstasy when she found that her generous husband intended she should possess both a very tall footman and a very little tiger it was as she told miss louisa perkins a proof of such lover-like attention as she never could forget such a multitude of people you know my dear are absolutely obliged to do with only one or the other that i feel very greatly touched i must confess by his so positively insisting that i should have both oh my dear louisa how heartily i wish that you and poor matilda too had exactly such a husband as mr o'donagough you have no idea i am quite sure it is impossible that you should have any idea how excessively kind he is to me good miss louisa fancied she had remembered a few little scenes not quite accordant with this testimony but she was far too obliging a person to remind mrs o'donagough at this happy moment of circumstances which had occurred at one less so and therefore only replied by uttering a sigh in a sort of coaxing cadence long drawn out which might be written thus oh 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 poor things muttered mrs o'donagough as she bustled off to receive and examine a dingy-looking woman who came as a candidate for the honour of being her cook and who like all other desirous of a place in her household presented herself at a given hour in the grand drawing-room of curzon street poor things what a shocking misfortune it is to be sure not getting a husband at all yet bless me so thin as they are and with such light little eyes what could they expect at length the important day arrived that was to convert mr o'donagough from a lodger into a householder a transition which from his lively recollection of past events amused as much as delighted him the footman the tiger the cook and the housemaid were all made aware that though the family had been constantly coming to town to look after the house they were nevertheless resident at richmond this was a sort of fact which mr o'donagough himself was particularly anxious to establish knowing as he sometimes hinted to his wife the real value of appearances a good deal better than she did he therefore arranged the ceremony of their entree into their mansion in the following manner mrs o'donagough and patty having been despatched by an early coach to an hotel at richmond the husband and the father superintended the removal of all trunks boxes bundles and baskets by a cart from the lodgings to the house 
and then mounting into an omnibus he rejoined the ladies indulged them very liberally with sandwiches cheesecakes and porter and then handed them into a post-chaise which four horses drew at full gallop to the inexpressible delight of patty to the mansion in curzon street where they were received by the footman the tiger the housemaid and the cook in a style which caused emotions in the breast of mrs o'donagough more easily imagined than described a well-spread tea-table awaited them and it was then and there that mr o'donagough thought fit to enter more at length than he had yet done into a statement of which he wished and expected from the two ladies under the novel circumstances in which they were now placed the conversation was however opened by his lady well my patty she exclaimed contriving by a skilful movement of her impressive person to bring her luxurious armchair a little nearer to the fire isn't this glorious i should like it better if there was more company replied her candid daughter that is very natural my dear observed her father gravely but it is not civil to say so and now we are on the chapter of manners it is just as well to tell you both at once that i must desire and insist that you are very careful on that point manners make the man you know and they make the woman too i promise you quite as much as fine eyes and a fresh complexion you must both of you be exceedingly careful to be always ladylike and perfectly genteel in everything you say and do mrs o'donagough became exceedingly red in the face while this was said not mrs malaprop when her parts of speech were attacked could feel more indignant than she did at this insinuation respecting the perfection of her manners this is something new she exclaimed while her expansive bosom heaved almost convulsively this is breaking out in a new place mr o'donagough i must say and pray what are you going to put into my daughter's head next if my manners are not good enough to be a model for her i should like very much to know where she is to find one from my very earliest childhood my manners have been remarked and it is not for me to repeat what has been said of them but this i will say that i believe you are the first that ever found out there was anything in my manners to be mended upon my honour my dear i did not mean to say anything at all affronting about your manners of course i admire them extremely replied mr o'donagough but patty is very young you know as yet and therefore i think it is as well to give her a hint that she must be careful not to be too frolicsome and rampageous if she intends to be my lady seymour the young man you see is a good deal with mrs hubert and that set and i'll bet you what you will that though he may be in love with our patty owing to their old acquaintance on board ship which is quite natural so handsome and affectionate as she is yet still i'll venture a good bet he'd say if he was asked that mrs hubert's manners and her daughter's too were exactly what is thought most elegant by people of high fashion and that's what you must try to appear if you can you know scarcely were these dangerous words uttered ere he was assailed by both wife and daughter who in the same instant burst upon him each trying as it seemed to outscream the other you don't mean to say vociferated the elder lady that any living being in their senses could give the preference to the cold starched hateful old maidish manners of agnes willoughby over mine mine gracious heaven that i should ever live to hear you say such a thing as that major mr i i mean mr allen o'donagough i should like to hear lord muckleberry's opinion on the point while these words were being uttered on one side of him a shrill young voice assailed him on the other with you think jack would like miss longshanks elizabeth better than me do you well then let him take her that's all i have got to say about it phew whistled mr o'donagough extending his hands as if to drive away a swarm of stinging flies what a racket you do make ladies about nothing at all you don't quite catch my meaning i perceive but perhaps by degrees i may be able to make you understand me better however we will say no more about it now if you please and by the by my barnaby there is something else to talk of which i dare say you will think more agreeable you have mentioned lord muckleberry and do you know my dear i should like exceedingly to find him out that you might renew your acquaintance and introduce me to him i will promise not to be jealous and i rather think he is one of the sort of people i should like to know there was in this speech wherewithal to heal very satisfactorily all the wounds inflicted by the former one the conversation immediately flowed into a most agreeable channel wherein a future of very great and hopeful splendour was sketched 
patty indeed fell asleep in the midst of it which was probably owing to some rather business-like details which entered into the discussion but scarcely ever had the ci-devant major and his barnaby passed an evening in more perfect harmony End of chapter twenty three